Welcome. The Young Jerks. We're live in Boston, and uh, we just followed by... What kind of show was that? That was like a rock show in here earlier. There was a rock and rock show. At it w- was WEMF Radio. That's right. Did you see who was performing in there? I don't know the name of the band, but they look like lovely people. Yeah, they are. They just uh, they they perform, you know, often at the Freedom Rally as yeah. well. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Who now, now I'm forgetting the name of the band. Like a <laughs> fool. We'll, we'll remember it. You know what? I, I, we'll do one better. If uh, anyone was out there listening, why don't you call in and tell Mike Can? Because he's looking at his friends over here, and he can't remember the name of their band, and he loves them. And I was just singing the song. It was like that chorus. You were. You were humming it, and I yeah. was like, Mike, come on. Don't quit your day job. Oh, man. <laughs> they played shows for us. That's what you'll remember. Yeah, we will. You in know? a minute. It'll be fine. But we got an awesome show planned. That's why I'm forgetful, because I'm so nervous. You know? You know. Yeah. I, I think it's going to be a really good show. And, and that was uh, that was a pretty intense uh, little opener we had there. What, what was that, Mike? What do you, what do you, oh, uh, the uh, film clip. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the film clip is the new movie. It's the follow up. Uh, the first movie was The Union, The Business Behind Getting High, which is uh, a documentary with a lot of different clips from uh, a lot of famous people and noted people in different fields talking about marijuana pro- prohibition and the business of it and really examining it. Examining it. Um, Adam Scorgi put that out, Canadian. Uh, it did really well. It, it was screened everywhere, and Todd McCormick. Someone we had on the show a few weeks ago, um, who's been a long-term activist in Rhode Island as well as California and Amsterdam worldwide, is someone that we're going to be speaking to today on the phone. I think we have him on the phone right now, hopefully. And uh, we're going to speak to him about the new follow-up, which people already know about. It's called The Culture High. That's right. And uh, I think we have Todd on the phone. So why don't we welcome Todd, who's an author. He's uh, someone that's brought out a lot of celebrities for cannabis reform. He's been on television. He's done movies. He's someone that's always working um, with a medical patient perspective because that's where he started as, you know, just from birth, what he had to go through. And he's never forgotten. He's continued the fight. And uh, we're always proud to have him on the show, Todd McCormick. Welcome to the show. Hey, guys. Thanks again for having me on. So what's, what's happening with this new movie? I'm super excited. We are right now showing it at film festivals. We will be releasing our trailer next week, and we will be having our theatrical premiere in October. After that, we're going to go DVD all over North America and video on demand all over the world. That's awesome. Video on demand is a good way to put out a movie like this, I would imagine. seems like some other movies in the same kind of genre documentaries have done well. Video on demand. For me, I started 20 years ago as an activist, literally, literally, quite literally, spending nights in Kinko's making photocopies so I could go to colleges the next day with Jack Herra and do what we called tabling, where we would put together information and try to hand it to people that were passing by to tell them about, you know, the wonders of cannabis. And it was frustrating, and it took a lot of effort. And now, you know, you create a document, put it on the Internet, you can have tens of thousands of downloads and even more views without anybody having to kill a tree. And it's quite amazing the way we can now disseminate information, which two decades ago, it was a slower process, you know, going to Kinko's and having to count the change in your truck so that you could make as many copies as possible to pass out the next day. (laughs) Now it's quite different. So, So I'm really excited about this. This video on demand not only puts it everywhere, but it motivates some of the people like Joe Rogan or Snoop Dogg or Richard Branson, people that are in it, to help us promote the film because now actually they can send their followers uh, with a hashtag to go download the film and they'll get a discount for their followers. So people get like 10% off either the download or the rental of the film. And this is something we didn't have before. When the union came out and it appeared on Super Channel, which is Canada's HBO, if you will, it immediately got videotaped and then people started trading it online because the information was just so important. And I personally think, you know, cannabis users have been oppressed for so long that we're all sort of looking for vindication. And when books like The Emperor Wears No Clothes by Jack Herrick comes out or or when a movie like The Union and, and now hopefully The Culture High comes out, it really vindicates a lifestyle that we have all chosen in a position we have all defended for so long with facts and just great information so. and, a, and a good look too and a, a smart intelligent it's just you know the first movie was I, I like that about it it was real it was real it was honest 
and it, and it featured a lot of you. Like you know, the fact fact that you you were in this movie and that's one of the you know best reasons about it too as well because an activist, someone who's a medical patient, you knew from the very beginning. I was very lucky to have a mom, you know, that that gave me cannabis and and was brave. I mean, in this film, we have some DVD extras where Dr. Lester Grinspoon, you know, the father of medical marijuana in many respects, tells of his story of Danny and his his wife Betsy going out and picking up some marijuana for her child who was going through chemotherapy and the difference it made in their life and unfortunately their son still sadly passed away from cancer but it, it alleviated so much of the anxiety and the sadness and the the pain the kid was going through from the treatment alone and it's been an amazing thing for me to be able to take the heroes I had like Dr. Grinspoon and try to highlight them in the films and uh, with the union that's what I was fortunate enough to be able to do I was able to lead this young group of filmmakers Adam Scorgi and Brett and Steven to people like Dr. Lester Grinspoon, Joe Rogan, Dr. Todd McCurea, the law enforcement at LEAP. You know, they made the great point, what was the first prohibition? And Adam makes the mistake of saying, alcohol? And he yeah. says, no, thou not eat from the tree of knowledge. And who is the cop? Hmm. And how many people did he have to watch? <laughs> <laughs> Failed. Yeah. There you go. So I feel it's like this is a great medium for spreading the knowledge. Yeah. And, yeah, it's an age age on like you know yeah not just since prohibition right it's age ages and ages and ages just different uh, levels of the fight, but it's the same. It is funny how it is the same, isn't it? Like the, how you how far you can bring a bad Todd. Well, you know what's amazing now is now we have a private here. In Cal- I live in California these days. I grew up in Rhode Island, but I moved west, and I we have now a quasi legalization with with medical marijuana was passed in 1996. But we're getting complete oppression from the powers that be because the governor, the police chiefs, the firemen they did no 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 one of them supported this publicly. So we've had nothing but oppression, and now we have because the cops don't have the funds or the money. We have five, we have private police uh, enforcement companies. They're they're not cops. They're really just thugs with helicopters and guns dropping out of the sky and cutting down people's pot plants. And I can't believe it because how many of these you know jackbooted thugs are going home and drinking some whiskey and smoking a cigar and thinking they had a great day? I know. And the hypocrisy is thicker than it's ever been. And taking prescription drugs, even. You know, I mean, how many of them? The, uh, it's, or it's even ridiculous. smoking weed when yeah, they get home. I know, that's true. <laughs> or, that even, or even lighting up and smoking weed. Not many, but some. But I would like to think that cannabis gives people a little bit of <laughs> perspective. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. I think it helps. <laughs> but you're absolutely right. We have had a lot of hypocrites. You remember the, the congressperson in Rhode Island that voted against medical marijuana and got busted, busted. in Connecticut, or a senator got busted in Connecticut with weed drunk driving. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So the hypocrisy is everywhere. And I think that's more of what we show in this film is that, you know, cannabis, I love Jack Herrer, and I've been an editor of The Emperor Wears No Clothes since 1994 when he passed away. I released the 12th edition of his book. But it's hard to describe to people, you know, his theory of why marijuana became illegal, that there was a big conspiracy and, and Andrew Mellon and the Treasury Department and Harry Anslinger, which is interesting, but I think the easy way to describe it is, man, after World War One and World War Two, crony capitalism took hold of this country, and everyone that had an influence in keeping cannabis illegal, from pharmaceuticals to, to, to alcohol to tobacco, they all stepped up and poured money on top of marijuana prohibition to make sure it stayed. And I think even right now, people don't understand this. Congress isn't doing anything. Why? Because they already wrote the check under Bush, and now they're just trying to get every single day a profit they can out of bombing the world before everybody wakes up and takes away their guns. Yeah. You know, because realistically, at some point, we the people got to step up and go, you, have, you, the military industrial complex, have created oppression and fake conflicts all over the world because every single year you want to sell all of your military and armaments and, and bombs to the American government because every single year the budgets only grow bigger. Well, you got to spend it all. Even the contracts, even though World War II is over, more money, more money, more, 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 more money is spent. Constantly. I want more. More, more, yeah, more, more, more. Yeah, one CIA agent 
because the, the defense budget is three quarters of a trillion dollars with profits as high as 25 percent. And when war is that profitable, you're going to see a lot of it. I know. Right. Uh, when Dick Cheney says things like, uh, you know, Obama has been soft. If he doesn't be careful, the, the, the ISIS or whoever is going to attack us. I always think, like, is Cheney making a threat? Is Because I think Cheney is ISIS. Like, hey, his side funded al-Qaeda. His side, they fund every single side of a conflict. His side, Dick Cheney and the crew, they funded every side of every conflict. So, therefore, they are the terrorists. Let's be real. You know, I don't want to be rude, but I don't think it I should think it's be true. possible for an American company like Halliburton to divest their, their president and then allow that guy to go and become vice president of the American government so he can go wage wars against countries like Iraq who never invaded us, didn't even throw a rock at us, okay? And suddenly we got to go in and kick their ass because they got oil. And you know what? There's no other reason. I mean, what yeah. happened to save our girls? Remember that bullshit? Not bullshit, but those girls were never saved, man. If they were oil, we probably have saved them. But then our kick-ass government, they didn't go in there and save those poor girls. They should have. Yeah. That's one case where I would have been proud to be an American and been proud to see my government go in there and fuck shit up a little bit because realistically, those those poor girls. Instead, what are we doing? Really, we're just selling guns to people who are using them against us so we can sell more guns to someone else to use them against them. And then we can use our guns against them. Yeah. It's fake. It's all <laughs> boys awful. playing with toy soldiers. And sadly, the toy soldiers are our sons, our daughters, our best friends. And at some point, you know, I think my activism will go from stopping the marijuana prohibition to stop the, the, the warring that we're doing because really it's war for profit. I'm, I'm so sick of it, you know? Yeah, I mean, you're usually fired up for the weed thing. Now it's it's. I see it. You look at you. you I mean, know, I love it. I'm, I'm surprised. You Frankie know? was like, like, had his arms up in the I air. I was, I was, I was pumping him because, like, for the last like couple of days, I've been like looking into looking into PNAC, which is the project for the New American Century, yeah. which is like Dick Cheney, yeah. Scooter, Libby, yeah. Paul Wolfowitz, Don Rumsfeld. Well, what's happened? You it's know, just, it's people. It's, they that, told you what they were going to do. Know, they know. told you what they were going to do, know. and then they're they're doing it right now, and it's it's insane. It's insanity. Project for the New American Century. Look it up. And we, you know, we have a show every week. We don't even talk about this stuff. We all know it. Like, yeah, we it's usually just like, keep it's like we want to talk about stuff. We always say that we can control. Like we feel like the weed thing is one of the things that is easier to win, and that's one of the reasons we we focus on that a lot in this show. I know you have Todd, and you've made difference. I focused on it because honestly, I, after beating Jack Herrer and becoming so involved in the Emperor Wears No Clothes as a book. What that book did for me is it put cannabis at the hub of all the things in humanity and civilization I didn't understand. Because when we're kids and we're taught, you know, well, we use trees for paper, they don't teach us that we used to use canvas and rags and we used to use cannabis hemp for paper and that actually paper was invented using hemp and mulberry uh, in China. They, you know, when they, when they teach us about the cotton gin, they don't teach us, wow, cotton gin only came around in 1790. What were we doing with slavery in 16? 1819 to 1790 for 180 years we had slaves and no cotton gins. What were they doing? Oh, they are breaking hemp because it turns out every single ship that sailed across the Atlantic had canvas hemp sails and if it wasn't for the cannabis hemp they wouldn't have had ropes and riggings and paints and varnishes and clothing and clothing, paper yeah. and maps and Bibles. So this was a huge part of our history that they just kind of exempted Lost from over. Yeah, and that honestly angered me to my core because then they call us dopers, stoners, everything negative they can. When reality is, is we're some of the more clear-minded, compassionate people. I mean, it's a group of stoners that's been birthed the environmentalist movement. When you really get into it, the True. whole earth was created by a pothead. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, so many times I watch on Twitter or, or Facebook where one of these politicians or one of these major people make a major like a corporations too, and I always say. Man, you guys do so missed the boat on this, you know, marijuana thing, or, or maybe it's another subject. And it's always you should have had hired a stoner, and that's true. It's like the smart stoner. Everybody knows a smart stoner. Uh, you know, it's it's you know when I got to L.A. and I started meeting some people, like for instance Hugh Hefner. It wasn't the wealth and the girls that impressed me. It was the the big heart this guy had. I mean, people don't know it, but he actually gave the first five thousand dollars and then the first fifty thousand dollars to start the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws back in 1970. And it was when I met people that were super creative in these really powerful positions like half and I realized god they're closet potheads there you go 
I, you know, I mean, you look at some of the most influential films and music of our of our generation. You know, there are potheads behind it. Look at McCartney, The Beatles. You know, that to get you into my life is a love song to marijuana. <laughs> yep. There you go. It really is. That is. You know? And I think that's fantastic. And I think there's going to come a time really quickly where people like you and me that made the decision to use cannabis, we're going to be heralded as more intelligent than as we were in the past, which is stoner stupid. Because people are going to look and go, wow, you guys are making better choices for your health, for your planet, for your communities. It's Good true. Thing, it's know? true. Like, look at the uh, new thing on OxyContin. There's been some new reports that show if you really, like, we, we have this big task force in New England now with all the governors and the police all getting together to go after OxyContin addiction, which, you know, sounds like a good thing. But they don't talk about marijuana where the new studies are showing it states with medical marijuana, OxyContin addiction and all addiction to opiates is down like 20, 30 percent. So it's so obvious that that would be the case because we talk to medical patients and they're able to reduce the amount of pills that they take. I would be on pills right now for my back condition for the last 15, 20 years if I didn't have medical cannabis. It, there's no, it's, so how many of us like that? Yeah. And I, I, honestly, guys, they fed me pills in Rhode Island Hospital my whole childhood and now I don't take anything. I don't think you can find Advil in this house. Yeah. I just deal with it. Because in a sense, I also think that in some ways it tunes us out of uh, the healing process. You know, and it's one thing to, like, alleviate symptoms of a problem. It's another thing to try to mask the problem. And some of those really hardcore oxycodones. Like, and I suffer from chronic pain. I have five, five of my first vertebrae are fused together from when I was only two years old. So I, I, I deal with or suffer through chronic pain on a constant level. It's just that... I felt like if I were to use cannabis, I could have a clear life, a healthy life. And my doctors were honest with me. They, well you know, said. when they they joked with me, saying, "Look, pot's not the worst thing for you. You know, anything else we can prescribe you, you'll become physically or mentally addicted." That, to it's, Todd, that's the same conversation I had recently. It's so true. It's so true. What you just said. Thank you for like saying it it's so clearly because. It's so true. I went back to my doctors. They said the same thing. They were like, why do you even want to look at this other stuff? If the cannabis is working, that's the best, softest stuff for you. Just don't even look at injections because of exactly what you're saying, Todd. It's so true. Dealing with You know, and I hate to break it to, you know, the bleeding hearts of America, but my doctor told me that I was 12 years old. There you go. Yeah, he was. I had gotten a new mini bike, and my neck always hurt because obviously there was, I was bouncing around trails with a helmet on. So, but on top of it, it was aggravating my spinal fusion. He just sat me down, gave me a hug, and said, "You got to learn how to deal with this. Do exercise, work out, make your neck stronger." He, he was so great. I mean, I'm so lucky. I got honest doctors in my life when I was a kid that really cared about me getting better and not really about selling more drugs or whatever you know because here in america i really feel like it's odd it's like once we're sick they capture us and they keep us sick and when i was a kid i was studying west eastern medicine and they were saying that when you're healthy you pay your doctors and then and then when you're sick you stop paying your doctors so your doctor's motivated to get you healthy get you back to work <laughs> <laughs> hey that's what we need in america you know what i mean for sure because you got people that are chronically ill. You know, everyone's on a pill. It's just insane. Well, they're customers. They're not patients. I mean, it comes down to the fact that a you know pharmaceutical company would rather you know feed you drugs every single month on a regimen rather than cure you and not be able to sell you drugs anymore. I call doctors pharmaceutical pill jockeys because of that. <laughs> I mean, it's hard for, I'm a veg. Carrying now, and a lot of that's because when I met Jack and I read about the nutritional elements of hemp food, I did not believe him. That's a polite way to put it because it comes across as a superfood, and people see this word superfood all the time. They think the frig is a superfood. If I'm starving, anything is superfood. Uh, the <laughs> truth is, is that all calories are not created equal. So if you get 100 calories from Doritos, they're empty calories, full of salt, full of sugar, full of nothing. But if you get 100 calories out of hemp seed, it's actually it's got all your essential fatty acids, it's got your aminos, it's got a full vitamin mineral count, and, and it's a very dense calorie. So what happens and why they're calling it superfood is just nutritionally dense calories. That it's are good. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, 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 you know, th th I used to think the same things about it until I started looking into it and discovering it and researching it. It's so true. And even with, like, uh, the ointments, you put it on your skin, the hemp bombs, 
you can feel it. Like, I don't even use that type of product, but someone gave me some one time, and I started using it, and I was like, oh, my God, I got to get the hemp, like, bomb on my face. It's like, it, their stuff is so good. I don't know what it is well, about this what? plant, but someone said some, earlier today, Trevor said it's because of the thousands and thousands of years of use that it was tested. It was tested. This thing, this plant has been used for so long by humanity. It is the best at so many things because of that. Well, you know, there's a place in uh, China. It's called Bama, China. Listeners can look it up. They have the oldest centurions, people that routinely live to be over 100 years old and actively work. And scientists have been going there for decades through the 20th century trying to figure out what their trick to longevity was. And, you know, you'll, you can go YouTube it and you'll see people talking about the sun and the air is clean and the water is clean. Well, then at the end you find out that ba, ma, ba means hemp in China and ma is like of. So these people live in a place called like land of hemp, if you will, and they all have cannabis hemp foods in their longevity soup, longevity lunch, longevity longevity dinner and now scientifically we can look at the hemp food and go it isn't the clean air it isn't just the clean water it's actually the fact that these are the only people on the planet that are getting super rich calories that are very good for them for instance they're getting a complete array of essential fatty acids which is linoleic linolenic and gamma linoleic which is gla everybody sees it now on fish well Think about this. Fish, the richest source of gamma-lealinic acid in fish is salmon. has about 500 million units per ounce of salmon. Yep. Hemp nut has 2,500 million units per ounce. Wow. Five times the richest source of salmon. And GLA, back in the day, women and bodybuilders would use cocoa butter because it would get rid of stretch marks. Well, now scientifically we know that it's the gamma linoleic acid in the cocoa butter that absorbs into our skin and brings back the elasticity, if you will, of our skin. Okay? Now, hemp is even richer than cocoa butter in gamma-linoleic acid, GLA. So now every woman listening to this should go out to a whole food or a, or a health food store, pick up a bottle of oil, and start putting it on their skin at night. It will get rid of, of your aging lines. It will tighten up your skin. It doesn't cause pimples because unlike a petrochemical, it's natural and it absorbs into your skin completely. Your body literally can feed off of hemp seed oil that you put on just like you were foliar feeding a plant. It's amazing. So I, I recommend it to everybody because we're all malnourished in the 20th century and we don't realize it. And the reason is is because when processing and homogenization and pasteurization and heating things up came into play so they could get more shelf life, the first thing that died was essential fatty acids. And we're all getting degenerative diseases now because back in the 40s and 50s, we as a society had an epiphany that vitamins and minerals were important. Well, then in the 80s, we realized that these essential fatty acids are so important, and science named them essential because unlike vitamins and minerals, like vitamin D, go sit in the sun, your body can make vitamin D. But EFAs, you have to consume. So we are not getting them in the foods that we're getting. If you eat out of restaurants all the time, you're getting practically no EFAs because all of that food was designed to have some some shelf life. Wow. And yeah. So so, so what I recommend to people listening is don't listen to me. Go online. I didn't I didn't even believe Jack Herrer when I read his book and he was standing next to me. <laughs> I had to go look it up myself. But now you go look up Essential fatty acids, there's a great book called Fats That Heal, Fats That Kill by Dr. Udo Erasmus, and in it he has a whole chapter about hemp food, and he calls it nature's most perfectly balanced oil. Wow, that's very interesting. It's, uh, you know, to look at just the entire, you know, plant of cannabis, it is amazing. Um, wrapping it up on the movie. When is this movie going to be in theaters? I know some people, it, it screams a lot. Like the last time it screamed a lot in these uh, festivals that come out, the big festivals. Is that how you guys plan to do that with this movie coming up? Or will it be in theaters locally in Boston? Um, both are happening. You know, film festivals are an important part of the filmmaking process because it's part of marketing and getting your film out there. 
Uh, we are in Iceland at the Reykjavik Festival this weekend, literally. Um, Adam and, and, and Brett and Stephen, I think, are out there together. Um, after the film festival's wrap, then what we have is a theatrical release. We're going to have a week in New York and a week in Los Angeles. And on top of that, we're working with a website called Tug, um, T-U-G-G. And what Tug does is it brings movies of importance of significance that are normally independent films to local theaters so people are like Rypack for instance in Rhode Island is able to sign up a theater with that will bring our film in and all they have to do is try to market enough of the tickets to their threshold and then they'll get it in and already about a dozen different people and organizations have lined up the culture high to come to their local community um, and you know the hardest part for us is you, you know as filmmakers nobody really wants to give you money to go rent theaters and market your movie and stand there and hopefully sell tickets to, to pay them back so uh, you see a lot of documentaries go direct to DVD um, which is why Tug is obviously coming together because people saw a need to bring local films of significance to their communities. They just didn't have a way of doing it. So now anybody listening to this could go onto the Tug website, type in the Culture High, sign up themselves, and contact their friends. And if they don't sell enough tickets to meet the threshold for the theater, nobody gets charged nothing happens it's it's really really great so i don't know and this is going to go on for one year from when we release in october so people if the film's super popular people will be able to bring it to their local theaters you could bring it to boston without any of my help if you wanted to all you'd have to do is do the same thing